The Social Self. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Del Frio, Iowa City, Iowa. The Social Self by George Herbert Mead. First published in Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 10, 374-380. Recognizing that the self cannot appear in consciousness as an I, that it is always an object, i.e. a me, I wish to suggest an answer to the question, what is involved in the self being an object? The first answer may be that an object involves a subject. Stated in other words, that a me is inconceivable without an I. And to this reply must be made that such an I is a presupposition, but never a presentation of conscious experience. For the moment it is presented, it has passed into the objective case, presuming, if you like, an eye that observes, but an eye that can disclose himself only by ceasing to be the subject for whom the object me exists. It is, of course, not the Hegelism of a self that becomes another to himself in which I am interested, but the nature of the self as revealed by introspection and subject to our factual analysis. This analysis does reveal, then, in a memory process, an attitude of observing oneself, in which both the observer and the observed appear. To be concrete, one remembers asking himself how he could undertake to do this, that, or the other, chiding himself for his shortcomings, or pluming himself upon his achievements. Thus, in the reintegrated self of the moment past, one finds both a subject and an object, but it is a subject that is now an object of observation, and has the same nature as the object self, whom we present as in intercourse with those about us. In quite the same fashion, we remember the questions, admonitions, and approvals addressed to our fellows. But the subject attitude which we instinctively take can be presented only as something experienced, as we can be conscious of our acts only through the sensory processes set up after the act has begun. The contents of this presented subject, who thus has become an object in being presented, but which still distinguish him as the subject of the past experience from the me whom he addressed, are those images which initiated the conversation, and the motor sensations which accompany the expression, plus the organic sensations, and the response of the whole system to the activity initiated. In a word, just those contents which go to make up the self which is distinguished from the others whom he addresses. The self appearing as I is the memory image self who acted toward himself and is the same self who acts toward other selves. On the other hand, the stuff that goes to make up the me whom the I addresses and whom he observes is the experience which is induced by this action of the I. If the I speaks, the me hears. If the I strikes, the me feels the blow. Here again, the me consciousness is of the same character as that which arises from the action of the other upon him. That is, it is only as the individual finds himself acting with reference to himself as he acts towards others, that he becomes a subject to himself rather than an object, and only as he is affected by his own social conduct in the manner in which he is affected by that of others that he becomes an object of his own social conduct. 
the differences in our memory presentations of the I and the me are those of the memory images of the initiated social conduct and those of the sensory responses thereto. It is needless, in view of the analysis of Baldwin, of Royce, and of Cooley, and many others, to do more than indicate that these reactions arise earlier in our social conduct with others than in introspective self-consciousness, i.e., that the infant consciously calls the attention of others before he calls his own attention by affecting himself, and that he is consciously affected by others before he is conscious of being affected by himself. The I of introspection is the self which enters into social relations with other selves. It is not the I that is implied in the fact that one presents himself as a me. And the me of introspection is the same me that is the object of the social conduct of others. One presents himself as acting toward others. In this presentation, he is presented in indirect discourse as the subject of the action and is still an object. And the subject of this presentation can never appear immediately in conscious experience. It is the same self who is presented as observing himself, and he affects himself just in so far and only in so far as he can address himself by the means of social stimulation which affect others. The me whom he addresses is the me, therefore, that is similarly affected by the social conduct of those about him. This statement of the introspective situation, however, seems to overlook a more or less constant feature of our consciousness, and that is that running current of awareness of what we do which is distinguishable from the consciousness of the field of stimulation, whether that field be without or within. It is this awareness which has led many to assume that it is the nature of the self to be conscious both of subject and of object, to be subject of action toward an object world, and at the same time to be directly conscious of this subject as subject, quote, thinking its non-existence along with whatever else it thinks, end quote. Now, as Professor James pointed out, this consciousness is more logically conceived of as a shusness, the thinker being an implication rather than a content, while the me is but a bit of object content within the stream of shusness. However, this logical statement does not do justice to the findings of consciousness. Besides the actual stimulations and responses and the memory images of these, within which lie perforce the organic sensations and responses which make up the me, there accompanies a large part of our conscious experience, indeed all that we call self-conscious, an inner response to what we may be doing, saying, or thinking. At the back of our heads, we are a large part of the time more or less clearly conscious of our own replies to the remarks made to others of innervations which would lead to attitudes and gestures answering our gestures and attitudes towards others. The observer who accompanies all our self-conscious conduct is then not the actual I who is responsible for the conduct in propria persona. He is rather the response which one makes to his own conduct. The confusion of this response of ours following upon our social stimulations of others with the implied subject of our action, is the psychological ground for the assumption that the self can be directly conscious of itself as acting and acted upon. The actual situation is this. The self acts with reference to others and is immediately conscious of the objects about it. In memory, it also reintegrates the self acting as well as the others acted upon. But besides these contents, the action with reference to the others calls out responses in the individual himself. 
there is then another me criticizing, approving, and suggesting, and consciously planning, i.e., the reflective self. It is not to all our conduct toward the objective world that we thus respond. Where we are intensely preoccupied with the objective world, this accompanying awareness disappears. We have to recall the experience to become aware that we have been involved as selves, to produce the self-consciousness which is a constituent part of a large part of our experience. As I have indicated elsewhere, the mechanism for this reply to our own social stimulation of others follows as a natural result from the fact that the very sounds, gestures, especially vocal gestures, which man makes in addressing others, call out or tend to call out responses from himself. He cannot hear himself speak without assuming in a measure the attitude which he would have assumed if he had been addressed in the same words by others. The self which consciously stands over against other selves thus becomes an object, an other to himself, through the very fact that he hears himself talk and replies. The mechanism of introspection is therefore given in the social attitude which man necessarily assumes toward himself, and the mechanism of thought, insofar as thought uses symbols which are used in social intercourse, is but an inner conversation. Now it is just this combination of the remembered self which acts and exists over against other selves with the inner response to his action which is essential to the self-conscious ego, the self in the full meaning of the term. Although neither phase of self-consciousness, insofar as it appears as an object of our experience, is a subject. It is also to be noted that this response to the social conduct of the self may be in the role of another. We present his arguments in imagination and do it with his intonations and gestures and even perhaps with his facial expression. In this way we play the roles of all our group. Indeed, it is only in so far as we do this that they become part of our social environment. To be aware of another self as a self implies that we have played his role, or that of another with whose type we identify him for purposes of intercourse. The inner response to our reaction to others is therefore as varied as is our social environment. Not that we assume the roles of others toward ourselves because we are subject to a mere imitative instinct, but because in responding to ourselves we are in the nature of the case taking the attitude of another than the self that is directly acting. And into this reaction there naturally flows the memory images of the responses of those about us, the memory images of those responses of others which were in answer to like actions. Thus, the child can think about his conduct as good or bad only as he reacts to his own acts in the remembered words of his parents. Until this process has been developed into the abstract process of thought, self-consciousness remains dramatic, and the self, which is a fusion of the remembered actor and this accompanying chorus, is somewhat loosely organized and very clearly social. Later, the inner stage changes into the form and workshop of thought. The features and intonations of the dramatis personae fade out and the emphasis falls upon the meaning of the inner speech. The imagery becomes merely the barely necessary cues. But the mechanism remains social, and at any moment the process may become personal. It is fair to say that the modern Western world has lately done much of its thinking in the form of the novel, while earlier the drama was a more effective but equally social mechanism of self-consciousness. And, in passing, I may refer to that need of filling out the bare spokesman of abstract thought, which even the most abstruse thinker feels in seeking his audience. The import of this for religious self-consciousness is obvious.
there is one further implication of this nature of the self to which i wish to call attention it is the manner of its reconstruction i wish especially to refer to it because the point is of importance in the psychology of ethics as a mere organization of habit the self is not self-conscious it is this self which we refer to as character when however an essential problem appears there is some disintegration in this organization and different tendencies appear in reflective thought as different voices in conflict with each other in a sense the old self has disintegrated and out of the moral process a new self arises the specific question i wish to ask is whether the new self appears together with the new object or end there is of course a reciprocal relation between the self and its object the one implies the other and the interests and evaluation of the self answer exactly to content and values of the object on the other hand the consciousness of the new object its values and meaning seems to come earlier to consciousness than the new self that answers to the new object the man who has come to realize a new human value is more immediately aware of the new object in his conduct than of himself and his manner of reaction to it this is due to the fact to which reference has already been made that direct attention goes first to the object when the self becomes an object it appears in memory and the attitude which it implied has already been taken in fact to distract attention from the object to the self implies just that lack of objectivity which we criticize not only in the moral agent but in the scientist assuming as i do the essentially social character of the ethical end we find in moral reflection a conflict in which certain values find a spokesman in the old self or a dominant part of the old self while other values answering to other tendencies and impulses arise in opposition and find other spokesmen to present their cases to leave the field to the values represented by the old self is exactly what we term selfishness the justification for the term is found in the habitual character of conduct with reference to these values attention is not claimed by the object and shifts to the subjective field where the effective responses are identified with the old self the result is that we state the other conflicting ends in subjective terms of other selves and the moral problem seems to take on the form of the sacrifice either of the self or of the others where however the problem is objectively considered although the conflict is a social one it should not resolve itself into a struggle between selves but into such a reconstruction of the situation that different and enlarged and more adequate personalities may emerge a tension should be centered on the objective social field in the reflective analysis the old self should enter upon the same terms with the selves whose roles are assumed and the test of the reconstruction is found in the fact that all the personal interests are adequately recognized in a new social situation the new self that answers to this new situation can appear in consciousness only after this new situation has been realized and accepted the new self cannot enter into the field as the determining factor because he is consciously present only after the new end has been formulated and accepted the old self may enter only as an element over against the other personal interests involved if he is the dominant factor it must be in defiance of the other selves whose interests are at stake as the old self he is defined by his conflict with the others that assert themselves in his reflective analysis solution is reached by the construction of a new world 
harmonizing the conflicting interests into which enters the new self. The process is in its logic identical with the abandonment of the old theory with which the scientist has identified himself. His refusal to grant this old attitude any further weight than may be given to the other conflicting observations and hypotheses. Only when a successful hypothesis, which overcomes the conflicts, has been formulated and accepted, may the scientist again identify himself with this hypothesis as his own and maintain it contra mundum. He may not state the scientific problem and solution in terms of his old personality. He may name his new hypothesis after himself and realize his enlarged scientific personality in its triumph. The fundamental difference between the scientific and moral solution of a problem lies in the fact that the moral problem deals with concrete personal interests in which the whole self is reconstructed in its relation to the other selves whose relations are essential to its personality. The growth of the self arises out of a partial disintegration, the appearance of the different interests in the forum of reflection, the reconstruction of the social world, and the consequent appearance of the new self that answers to the new object. End of The Social Self